this proves that if Johnson goes, Brexit will be in danger. That is the key element of Johnson's appeal. I'm Brendan Donnelly. I'm the director of the Federal Trust, an educational charity specialising in European issues. There have been a lot of European issues thrown up by the events of this week. And I'm going to be discussing them with the chairman of the Federal Trust, John Stevens. John, thank you for joining us. Um, do you think that um, Boris Johnson can survive what happened on Monday? And if so, how will he manage to do it? Well, I do think he will survive, yes, because I think what people are underestimating in the current situation is the extent to which he has transformed the nature of the Conservative Party and created circumstances in which getting rid of him will be extremely difficult. And in essence, what he has done is uh, produced an English nationalist narrative, which will feed on uh, opposition, both internal and external, to continue to sustain the majority, not all of it, but a significant part of the majority that he achieved in 2019. Uh, and to explain that a bit, I think that it's at the moment, many commentators are judging the current situation with the eyes of the old politics. And he has created a new politics. Brexit has created a new politics in Britain, a polarization. And I thought particularly indicative of this was the way in which a number of people have come out and said that Tobias Elwood suggesting that we should be returning to the single market was leapt upon by many commentators in the Conservative Party and beyond and saying, well, this proves that if Johnson goes, Brexit will be in danger. And that is the key element of Johnson's appeal, is that he is seen as the guarantor of Brexit. And to get rid of him will be to admit, to a degree, that Brexit was an enormous error. But among the 148, there were many supporters of Brexit. It was a very wide ranging insurgency. If he had that grip over the Conservative Party that um, some people think he has, then he wouldn't have um, provoked or they wouldn't have had the courage to stand up to him in the extent they did. Well, it's true that people like um, Steve Baker um, believe that um, Johnson has been uh, betraying Brexit because he hasn't gone far enough, he hasn't been bold enough, and there are all the people around that group of hardline anti-Europeans who are now pushing Johnson to be tough, for example, on the Northern Ireland Protocol. But, I mean, that really underpins my point, is that the, the polarisation in politics is between those who still fundamentally support Brexit and those who regard Brexit as a, as a mistake. Um, and Johnson has made himself the guarantor of Brexit. Now, if he is removed, he will be only removed by someone who thinks that they can do a better job at protecting Brexit, uh, which is Baker's position, which is also, I think, um, uh, Penny Morden's position. Um, and I think her emergence um, as being now second favourite to succeed Johnson is, is also indicative. I mean, she is someone who was a very strong Brexiteer. The idea that um, Johnson is going to be replaced by someone who takes a softer line on Europe, I think is completely incredible. Yes, um, I agree with that, but I am a little more pessimistic or optimistic, depending on your point of view, about his chances. I think historically, um, it's not a good sign for a, a sitting Conservative um, prime minister or leader of the party um, to have so many of his or her MPs voting against him or her. Uh, I would be very surprised if he, he survives until the party conference. Well, we'll see. But I, I just feel that he cannot be judged, and I don't think British politics can any longer be judged, by uh, the rules that prevailed in the past. And Johnson is a very different type of prime minister than anything we have had, uh, well, really, since the 18th century. And um, he is uh, employing tactics now um, that have um, distinctly um, authoritarian uh, undertones. 
And it's worth pointing out that before the 2019 election, he effectively threw out the leading pro-Europeans from the party. I don't exclude him um, effectively deselecting um, a number of opponents uh, in order to uh, frighten uh, the rest of his opponents. And that could be linked to a strategy of having a, an early election um, before the full economic difficulties that the United Kingdom faces um, kick in and allowing him to blame those difficulties, uh, the cost of living um, in particular, on other factors, on COVID and on, um, on Putin's invasion of, of Ukraine. Do you think his uh, narrow majority on, on Monday will have any impact upon, direct impact upon the policies he follows over the next couple of months, in particular the Northern Ireland Protocol? Might that narrow majority dispose him more to compromise or, or, or on the contrary, to, to an even more truculent line? I think what he wants to achieve is the issue remaining open so that it is still possible to blame the EU for difficulties, but not take things to such a point where there would be a collapse in relations with the EU and in particular a trade embargo. In a sense, he's riding a, a middle ground between the line uh, apparently taken by uh, Liz Truss, which is um, on the basis of her very recent remarks, um, a very forceful one, um, and the line taken by a number of his um, uh, opponents in the, in the leadership uh, confidence vote, who clearly want to put to bed the Northern Ireland Protocol and say that we've got to accept it, and, in, and are talking up, for example, uh, the risks of uh, being in breach of international law and the message that that sends. I think what he wants is to uh, is to steer a middle course so that he doesn't um, either go too far and create a crisis um, or uh, remove the position of being able to blame Europe for uh, the difficulties that Northern Ireland um, he claims is ha uh, um, are having. Um, on account, of, on account of the protocol. You mentioned Tobias Elwood, and there have been one or two other um, outriders in the conservative press um, talking about either the internal market or a, a more um, conciliatory, um, integrative view uh, of future trade relations, in particular with the, with the European Union. Um, it sounds from what you say that you, you think Johnson will have no truck whatsoever with that, that he will... Um, uh, want to insist that the sort of Brexit that he's putting forward is the only authentic Brexit, and um, uh, it's simply a, di a diversion, um, what Elwood and others are coming up with. Well, I, I think he will, and he, I think he's already made that clear, but he has the benefit in, in, on this occasion of actually um, speaking the truth, which is that actually any rowing back from um, the uh, very hard line Brexit that he has taken, and particularly any concept of rejoining the single market with all that, that would imply, is just an inconceivable step. It would be the beginning of the end of Brexit, because it would take a very short time for people to realise that being back in the single market, but being without the capacity to set any of its rules and have any say over its conduct is a completely untenable position. How do you think events over the next uh, few months in Ukraine may affect Johnson's position? Um, part of the cultural wars, if you like, um, that this government is, is waging um, is precisely that um, outside the European Union, the United Kingdom has been able and willing to help Ukraine in a much more robust and effective way than they might otherwise have been able to, while um, the French and the Germans um, uh, aren't as uh, as bellicose or robust in their denunciation of um, of the Russian position. Um, how, how do you think that's going to play in in British political d discourse over the next few months? Well, I think the Ukraine crisis is emerging as a major weapon for the um, position of Johnson and the the strength of his position, and for the 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 anti um, European case in general. Because it's not just that um, the UK has been free, supposedly, to adopt a more robust policy. It, it, it is a, a comprehensive critique of the entire approach taken by 
uh, the Germans in particular, but also the European Union in general in becoming dependent on Russian oil and going actually right to the core of the premise of the European Union, that peace is obtainable by economic engagement and integration. I mean, that, that is the depth of the critique that the um, Brexiteers are making in justifying um, their position vis-a-vis uh, -vis what has happened um, in the policy towards Russia. And uh, th that is why I believe that um, when, uh, as I expect, there is some diminution of hostilities, I mean, it may not be a, a full-blown um, peace, but um, there will be some uh, stabilization, stalemate, um, in Ukraine. This will be a moment when Johnson will be able to declare that he has made a major contribution to uh, preventing uh, Russian aggression and deterring Russian aggression uh, in sustaining the survival, which I think is now beyond doubt, of Ukraine as a sovereign state in some form. I mean, leaving aside the question on precisely what frontiers. And this may be the moment in which he chooses to call an early election before... <laughs> Yeah. Um, the the economic difficulties really start to bite, and we think he's got a good chance on, on the Russians and and also on COVID. And you think he's got a good chance of winning that election? I do. I don't think he 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 has got. Um, I, I think his chances are are considerably better than 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 currently um, uh, optimistically <laughs> portrayed in in a number of circles. Um, because he's got a very substantial majority. I think it's possible to imagine him being returned with a majority of only 40 or so. But um, I think it's very difficult to imagine, given um, the fact that what the Labour Party is offering is simply a negative picture. They are saying that they're not Johnson. And um, for, for people who are deeply concerned about politics and deeply concerned about the impact that his um, extraordinarily immoral conduct has led to in, in terms of damage on the British constitution and the British state. Uh, those, those concerns are, the, are a tiny minority, unfortunately. And I think it, portraying that he has been vindicated on Brexit because he has been able to stand up to Russia and Europe has been humiliated by Brexit, its entire economic and energy policy has been discredited and things. Um, he'll be able to, to portray himself as the guarantor of Brexit um, that the country doesn't want to reverse Brexit, doesn't want to go back to the arguments of Brexit. Um, and he would have a good chance of getting through, I regret to say. How would the role of the SNP, in your view, play out in such an election? Well, that would be a further weapon in his armoury, because um, in appealing to his now essentially English nationalist electorate, uh, one of the um, prospects that uh, a change of government would entail would be some form of coalition between the Labour Party and the Liberal Democrats, dependent to a degree on the votes of the Scottish nationalists. And it's very difficult to come up with uh, a plausible scenario for the outcome of any um, future general election um, over that over the, this time scale without such a, a, an outcome. And um, to say that, therefore, uh, English interests would be hostage to Scottish nationalists would be a very easy thing to portray. And I don't think the Labour Party, or the Liberal Democrats for that matter, have got a, really an answer to that. Interesting times. Uh, those who live longest will know most. Thanks very much for the analysis, John. We'll be carrying it on in the coming months. Okay.